call this meeting of the Manchester by the Sea so let's do it to order. Um, roll call. Jeff? Yep. Brian? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Anthony? Yes. John? Yes. Okay. Um, the first item on the agenda um, is public comment on non agenda items. Is there anyone online? Um, <coughs> there are people online. I don't see anyone raising their hand. Okay. Um, the next is the chairman's report, and today I have a chairman's report of oh. sorts, which is that we are going to ask to pass over two of the items that are on the on the uh, agenda. The first one is the one Spiron Hill update, and I asked to have it put on the agenda because it's become a significant issue in town, and I wanted to get. Um, all of the town employees who are involved in um, regulating um, that kind of act, that those activities together so that we could hear from them what they're doing, what the law actually is. I wanted everyone on the select board together to hear it from them in one place and in public. Um, the Owners have asked that they be present with their um, attorney, and their attorney is busy tonight, so we will reschedule this. Um, the other thing that we are skipping over is the CST construction um, uh, start time request. Um, Discussing it with Mark Glovsky, who's the CSD's attorney, and Greg, we felt that it would be better to wait until the planning board makes its takes its position. Um, our the bylaw is does not clearly allow us to override. There is no provision for us to override the by, bylaw. That's clear. Uh, our town council has said that. Um, if it were a major, if it were a public safety issue, but um, haven't yet heard. Uh, so I have asked Mr. Glovsky um, to come back after the planning board has made its decision on what their start time will be and talk to us, um, explain to us why it is a public safety issue. And I think we can wait and discuss that. Mm -hmm. That. Okay. Um, we've listed the senior care update for 6.5. Um, and if you want to go ahead and get ahead of schedule, or because I think the people from the person from senior care is here. My agenda says 6.30. Ah, that's that the Spy Rock Hill update. Oh, it says, mine says senior care. I must have, maybe it's just the view I'm in. Sorry. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, no, it's so like 6.45 here, but I'm, yeah, 6.45 here. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Or should we um, start with the consent agenda? Um, are, are there... Any items that anyone would like to have removed from the consent agenda? Okay. Um, in that case, we have a motion on the yeah. consent agenda. You have a motion to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. I'll call vote. John? Yes. I say yes. 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 Yeah. Well, there's another man. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Nine more to go. <laughs> Do you want to review the action list? The action items? That, yes. 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 I skipped that. You're right. That would be a good thing. Okay. Is there anything? So 
So there's something I wanted to bring up to see if um, there's any action the board wants to take. We haven't discussed it previously. Um, the website for the town was recently updated, mm -hmm. and it looks very nice. You know, I sent Tiffany a note. Um, I think it looks very nice. And the team has worked very hard to delete old content that shouldn't be there because that messes up the search if someone's trying to search for something. Um, but it's really important that the content and the pages be maintained. So we have a select board page. And, you know, I guess my point is who is accountable for the content on that page? And um, I, I think somebody should be. Um, and for the other boards as well, I, it's just not clear who owns it. Somebody's got to own responsibility for keeping it fresh. And so I wanted to ask Greg that question, or, or does the board need to get engaged at all in that? Um, so it's, it's department head should be responsible for their departmental page. Um, each committee, the chairperson or, or the designated person of that committee should be responsible for letting Tiffany know what changes or updating should be done. Um, so it's uh, sort of an ongoing process. And, um, but that's the, that's the structure. So that's the structure. That's good. I, I think it may be good for you to discuss with Tiffany offline um, what the process is for um, kind of nudging people. I mean, uh, from an that's, operational standpoint, I, I think the maintenance of the website needs to belong in town hall. And yes, the committees need to perhaps approve the content that goes out there or request content to go out there. But there's a cadence around uh, keeping it fresh. Somebody's got to notice that something's old. Yep. That type of responsibility I'm uncomfortable putting on volunteer boards because there's too many changes in players and and it's been my experience it should be run as a part of town operations type of thing so um, right so it's 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 a process of you know Tiffany but Tiffany doesn't know what the committee wants on and all right it's more so, of a um, like a you know most places that have been they they have a, a like a schedule or a cadence around you know sending a note out to all the boards or departments hey right. it's time to update your page take a look Yep. There's a cadence around that, and mm -hmm. I, I, I think otherwise, we've got some pretty old content out there, right. and we might want to set a better example for the rest of the committees. Mm -hmm. is, is this information past your desk, or is it largely, when Tiffany gets it, it goes, unless perhaps she feels, well, maybe somebody else should look at this? Right. Typically, yes. The okay, latter. so I assume, all right, so most of it, she probably said, all right, this makes sense. Uh, right. who's it? Okay. Yeah. Perhaps after the, we have a town election or a, a round of um, board changes, yeah. right. um, Debbie could yeah, yeah. just, just yeah. remind us to give me a minute. Is there? Anything else that we want to add or change? Okay. We uh, I can give, <coughs> I can give a liaison update that would for be great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, everything's running smoothly. So getting ready for uh, now the after school programs and but as far as uh, they are now looking at uh, CPC funding so they're looking at some projects that uh, including uh, the bathhouse at the beach uh, what can and cannot be done at Sweeney Park in the back side of the back of uh, Sweeney Park as far as new fields uh, mm. expanding that um, and some other items there but uh, they're looking at that. Um, they next, I think they're gonna start. They're gonna tackle naming Pine Street that field because <laughs> 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 apparently Pine Street field doesn't work. <laughs> so there's some new signage at the uh, 
I don't know if anyone's noticed it. It's at Masconomo and at the entrance to uh, Sweeney. And, uh, so, and just trying to maintain some uniformity with all the signage for all the town fields going. So that's what all of a sudden brought the discussion to Pine Street. Are you going to name it Pine Street, put a sign up there, or are you going to name it something else? So they'll, they'll tackle them. It's not to tackle that next, uh, next meeting, next month. Speaking yeah. of signage. Greg, where are we on implementing the signs that we approved as part of the wayfinding effort? I had that same question in my head the other day, um, so I, I need to follow. Maybe Sean. that's something we could put on the action item list. I, I mentioned it to Sean Johnson. I was that. curious of what's going on with that. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I need to check in. I've lost track of where that is. Jeff, do you have? Um, well, a lot of us were at the planning board meeting last night, but the um, permits did pass for the Reed Park and Morris Pier. Um, one of the things that did come up was, uh, and actually Greg might want to talk about this, um, the ADUs the, for the mass, the new ADU law. Right. So there's an issue there, I guess. Yes. Yeah, so um, as part of the... Um, Affordable Housing Act that was passed this past legislative session. Um, it uh, requires that ADUs under, I think it's 900 square feet, um, automatically, it's a by right use. And that, that's across in the single, common I think it's only in, in single, single, yes, in single yeah. family resident zones. Yeah. It uh, must be a by right use um, in all communities. So there's a concern um, that unless the town also has some policies around short-term rentals, that a lot of those, uh, there may be a, a, a rush to build ADUs that, that serve that market, um, which would sort of defeat the purpose of, of, uh, of ADUs helping with the housing um, issues that the Commonwealth has. <clears throat> so there are two ways to go about it. We, we could address it through zoning, but you can also address it through a, a general bylaw. We, we already have a general bylaw I thought we already had one. that regulates, uh, regulates short-term rentals, but it's frankly very weak. No. It, it only captures rentals that are six days or less. Uh, okay. Um, so it so most people say, well, I'm, I'm yeah. mine's available for seven days or more, and we don't, we, thus we don't regulate that. Um, so there was concern that the town take some action and, and update the general bylaw to, to better address uh, the use of short-term rentals and how they can be done. Um, and in last night's meeting, I mentioned that the city of Gloucester just adopted pretty rigorous um, new bylaw, city ordinance, to um, to regulate short-term rentals. And I think it's worth a look at that as a model that we might um, draw from. Yeah, I, I fully support that. I um, I was going to bring that up as part of the. Um, it, it's also an issue I think for the proposed MBTA zoning if that goes forth. You know. Um, Manchester and other seaside towns, you know, those extra units could be for, you know, short-term rentals and um, Airbnbs instead of the housing right. uh, for full-time residents that issue. we want it to be. Yeah, it's yes. the same issue. So I think that's a great idea. Uh, just updating the general bylaw instead of trying to put some new language in some other place. Unless, right. yeah. I think the problem's the timeline, right? I mean, so the new law takes effect February. <coughs> early February. Um, so, um, you're able to move forward a proposed general bylaw change a little faster than the zoning bylaw gets crafted and, and adopted. Um, so, we, we could put that on a bit of a fast track um, to get it ready for the November special town meeting. Okay. I'm not sure that that's wise. Well, let me, let me ask a question. Um, we, this board has approved Airbnbs, right? Short, short right, based on our current regulation. 
And again, we're only capturing those people who are using or renting for six days or less. So there are other Airbnbs in town that are for seven days or more, and we can't. Which currently we don't have. We a, don't have the authority to correct. regulate those. Correct. There okay. is a reason for that, okay. or partial reason for that, is that there are still a few family compounds where there are several houses owned by the third or fourth generation, yes. and the they. The pre people who use them are family members, but they pay for it, right. and they're third cousins. Right. But I mean, there should be a way to write the, enhance the law, uh, modernize it, and right. some we, exceptions we create, for specific properties. We can that, create yeah. some exceptions yeah. and capture yeah. that issue, I think. Yeah, or the let's district, put, or the district, or something like that. Yeah, yeah let's put this on for maybe the second October. Can we? Well, I think we should take a look at it at the next meeting. Yeah, I do. You're, you're targeting the November meeting? If, if you want to do it in November, then we I, really I think it would make the town residents feel better if we proactively try and address a very valid concern. Because I, I think it is directly, it, it was brought up under the construct of the ADU discussion, but it's very right. relevant to the MBTA zoning. Right. Yes. And I, I think it would make it more likely. Well. My understanding is if we let it go past February, we can't go back, right? Isn't that the issue? So so if we wait until the annual town meeting in late April, so there would be that period from early February until um, the, the annual town meeting where someone could apply for an ADU, get it approved, and, and the, the, yeah, the short-term so rental uses would, would, would not apply to that. They'd be grandfathered in under. Okay, then yeah, I, I would really like to get this. Yeah, I don't know how many. I don't know how many applications you get in that mm -hmm. two and a half month period, but I, I think we're going a little bit beyond yes. the agenda. Yes. The, the agenda. I think. Yes. Yeah, no, okay. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Fair enough. So we can yeah we can put this on the next one. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Um. Senior care update. Yes. You want me to stay here? Is this uh, fine? That's, that's fine. Okay. So, um, thank you for having me tonight. I'd like to thank Greg and uh, the select board. My name is Scott Trekkie, I'm the CEO at Senior Care. And I'm kind of making the rounds in our nine communities, meeting with the select boards as well as um, upcoming the two city councils for Wasser and Beverly, which we both, which we also covered. Um, I met with Greg earlier this year to kind of update Greg on some new programs and services that we have at Senior Care, which I'd like to highlight tonight. I can a very full presentation or I'll be here forever. Um, I did want to, to give a shout out to um, Nancy Hammond, um, the Council on Aging, the Senior Center. Uh, we collaborate with Nancy on, on different things. Um, and I'd also like to give a shout out to the first responders here in Manchester. Um, they've been very helpful in, in terms of reporting uh, people in need uh, that reside in this community, as well as um, working with us with some of our adult protective services cases as well. Um, representing Manchester on our board of directors is Jane Matrano. Um, and I know Jane is pretty active here in town and, um, and a good advocate for for seniors. So I had provided Greg with a sheet. I can't go through the whole thing of kind of statistics about what our activities are here in, in Manchester. Um, and, and I gave Nancy, Nancy stopped by the office last week, and I gave her, hopefully you all got packets. You got packets, all right, very good. Um, with some of our, some of our brochures, um, certainly if you have any questions, uh, and anything that you see or read, please just reach out to me um, at any time. So new programs and services. One of the new programs that um, the Executive Office of Health and Human Services at the state level has implemented, not only for um, us through the Executive Office of Elder Affairs, but also Department of Developmental Services and Department of Mental Health, we're charged with identifying people who reside in nursing facilities. 
I know you don't have one here uh, in Manchester. Uh, in our catchment area, we have uh, six nursing homes slash rehabs. So they provided us with funding such that we have a full-time staff person who makes the rounds at the various nursing facilities, meets with the residents, and identifies folks that want to go back to their communities or want to return somewhere in the community. So we're tasked with trying to help them to do that. Um, as you might imagine, the biggest challenge that we face, the biggest obstacle is affordable housing. Um, that's clearly throughout Massachusetts the biggest, biggest challenge. But I, I like to let, even though you don't have a nursing facility here in Manchester, I do like to let folks know that um, that, that is a, a new service uh, that the uh, agencies like us offer because you may have a resident that goes to Blueberry Hill or Seacoast or, or work wherever or a resident there. Um, so I wanted you to know about that. By the way, please stop me at any point that you, you may have questions. Um, senior care is uh, very into consumer-facing technology. Um, we have received a, a couple of grants, one of which is from Addison Gilbert and Beverly Hospital, and another from Mass Broadband Institute. So we have a couple of staff who are dedicated to the technology needs of, of people that reside in their catchment area in Manchester. So for the hospital, um, the hospital grant, what we're doing is we are utilizing virtual reality um, and targeting folks who are socially isolated, lonely, perhaps have um, uh, depression and or anxiety. So we run small groups. Um, we partner with a company called Rendever, um, who provides the, the headsets. So pe four people wear a headset. And we have a technology navigator who has a control panel. Um, each of the participants see the exact same thing. They can look all around. Um, and what we have found is that, is that people begin to engage with each other. Um, the experiences that they can have are limitless. So if somebody may want, you know, there, there may be a common interest, which we try to find. Uh, maybe, you know, the group is into visiting some sort of museum in, in Europe. Um, or they want to go see the home that they, they grew up in. Um, we can bring them right in front of their house um, to kind of see their home. Um, so that's something that we're doing. That's something certainly, anything I talk about here is available to, you, to your residents. Um, typically, we, we do the VR groups um, in housing or uh, through the Councils on Aging. Um, we have a partnership with a company out of Boston called, called Tech Goes Home. And what we do there is Techno Goes Home has a 10 session curriculum that one of our staff was trained in. And basically it's Computer 101. So we hold, we hold groups um, throughout the area. Um, it's 10 sessions. The nice thing is at the end of the session, um, the participants get a free Chromebook. And in some cases, one free year of uh, internet service as well. Um, if you have any residents who need help in the home, um, say with computer-related issues, or they can't get their printer working, or they have some sort of issue with cell phones, with their cell phone, um, our tech nav navigator can make an appointment with them, go to the home, and, and um, try to help them out. Um, another thing that we have is something called Care Coach. Um, Care Coach utilizes avatar technology. So we have deployed a lot of these, especially during and after the pandemic. Care Coach is a, comes with a tablet that is pre-programmed. Um, the tablet has, uh, an older adult can either choose a dog or a cat. It's a touch screen. The elder is in complete control of it. And behind that tablet, which they can move, bedroom, living room, wherever they want it to be, they can turn it on or off, is a 24-7 health coach. Um, so there is not only verbal communication, but also text as well. Um, so what we do with Care Coach is we program it based upon a, a person's needs. So a common one would be medication reminders. So at different points for the day, the Care Coach um, unit through the avatar will cue the older adult to take their medications. It might be reminders of upcoming uh, physician appointments or 
if someone has to take their weight on a daily basis or drink X amount of glasses of water, um, we can program it um, to do that. The other um, feature of it is a caregiver um, can video conference in. So the care coach tablet will ring and there can be face-to-face -face communication with a caregiver, friend, whoever. We have found that that's very helpful for long distance caregivers who uh, you know, want to check on mom, uh, maybe they're in California, um, but they want to make that daily call and eyeball mom and make sure everything's, everything's going well. What we did with CareCoach is we combined it with a company that we contract with called QMedic. And QMedic provides cellular personal emergency response systems. The old lifeline units, I've fallen and I can't get up, press the button. The technology has increased significantly over the years um, such that um, the person can leave the home. It used to be that you had to be in the home, you, you had to be within a certain range. I'm dating myself here, but you had to be in a certain range of the, the unit that was in the home in order for the button to transmit to the unit. That's no longer the case. Um, so we offer that package of care coach and the personal emergency response system. So um, we also received a grant from um, the Executive Office of Elder Affairs relative to caregivers. So the needs of caregivers um, certainly increased during the pandemic. Um, which exacerbated the needs of caregivers, and we've seen that continue post-pandemic. So the grant that we have, um, there, there are a couple things to know. Um, one is that we have relationships with many um, uh, places throughout the catchment area, just to name a few, Essex Greenbelt, a um, bunch of different places that will have lunches for caregivers with a loved one with uh, dementia. So places like the Depot Diner, the Village Pancake House, Bullport. Um, it's really geared toward caregivers of um, a little bit of dementia. Cabot Theater, we've shown uh, <coughs> movies like To Catch a Thief, Singing in the Rain. We get like 250 people that, that attend these. North Shore Music Theater will give us free tickets. Um, Gloucester Stage Company, KPM Museum, the Zen Center in, in Hamilton. And we also offer, actually it's one of your residents, Abby, um, offers a, a uh, evidence-based program called Savvy Caregiver. And it's a series of classes, uh, eight to 10 classes per session. And Abby follows the curriculum, which you have to do to the T, uh, but it's geared to help caregivers of uh, a loved one with dementia to be better, better able to care for their, for their loved one. Um, the other part of that, which I want you to know about, is that we are able to offer scholarships to caregivers. Um, I can't recall if, if we've done any here. I do not believe that we have. But in any event, we've done things like replace a stove of a person who had dementia, who had a gas stove, and it was unsafe for them, so we swapped it out, bought them an electric stove manicures, pedicure, pedicures, gym memberships, um, whatever is going to, you know, a day out of the house where we can get somebody to stay with, uh, with a loved one um, to give them a little bit of a break. The one thing I'll say about the, that is caregivers will never apply on their own behalf. So if you or someone, is this videotape, just go out to the community. Yeah. So if a community member knows of someone who is in fact a caregiver, um, we have an application that they can fill out on behalf of that person. Um, so why don't you two also know about that. Um, switching gears, home care programs. So we're charged by Elder Affairs with implementing the Massachusetts State Home Care Program. And um, there is a workforce shortage. And the workforce shortage is specific to homemakers, personal care workers, in home health aides. And it was bad before the pandemic, got worse during the pandemic, and it has continued to be bad, such that um, people often have to wait for services, which is horrible, right? Typically, when someone calls us, um, they're going to get our information in the referral department, we're going to take their, their information, demographics, etc. Usually, when people call us, they're already in crisis, or maybe they should have called us three months ago, right? 
Um, and oftentimes they have to wait for the initiation of those three services. We will try to put other things in the home to help uh, relieve the stress and meet, meet their basic needs. But in terms of waiting, like if you need a bath or, or you know, someone to assist with a bath or something like that, um, there's often, often a wait list. It's getting a little bit better. We contract out for those services. So we have 17 contracts with different agencies that offer personal care homemakers and home health aides. What I really want to talk about is a state home care program called the Consumer Directed Program. In this program, the older adult, the recipient of the care, can become an employer. So we assist with, we contract uh, statewide, a company called Tempest is used, which is the fiscal intermediary. So they take care of things like payroll, unemployment, workers' comp, end of the year taxes, etc. The first step is the uh, older adult, the recipient of the care, or a surrogate if they don't want to do it, um, becomes an employer. At that point, once that is accomplished, um, that person can hire whoever they want. So they bypass the agencies that we contract with. And oftentimes it's a family member, it's a friend, it's a neighbor, and oftentimes it's somebody who's already helping them. That person is, is paid. Um, somewhere in the neighborhood of $20 an hour. Um, but the older adult is in charge of everything. So they're in charge of training the person, hiring, firing, scheduling, uh, making sure that they fill out their time sheet that goes to Tempest so that the person can be paid. So we've really ramped up, ramped this up, especially during, um, during the pandemic and continue to promote this as a a, um, you know, a solution for uh, workforce shortage. And the workforce shortage is not unique to our 24 uh, ASAPs throughout Massachusetts. Um, we all have different names. We're all nonprofits. Um, hospitals are experiencing this. Visiting nurse associations as well as hospitals, especially with nurses. So I don't know where people went uh, after the pandemic, but they can go to work. <laughs> Uh, so I wanted you to know about that as an alternative to a traditional uh, Massachusetts state home care program. Um, we have a pet program. It's called Stay Pet Services, serving the animals you love. Um, so we will do things like dog walking or if someone is hospitalized, um, we can go into the home, feed the fish, take care of the bird, change the kitty litter, whatever, whatever might be needed. And we also will assist with uh, transportation of the pet to the vet. And with low-income elders, um, we do have uh, money that we receive from Meals on Wheels of America, uh, so we can help to defray some of the costs of uh, veterinary care as well. Um, we're ramping up right now with Shine Counseling. Right, October to December is uh, open enrollment for Medicare. Um, we have a shine counselor at senior care. Um, we take appointments. He, during October to December, he'll be there three times a week. We simply call senior care and schedule an appointment and, and uh, um, come to, to senior care and get that counseling. Um, I have some stats. I'm not going to go over all of them, but for instance, Meals on Wheels, everyone associates senior care with with uh, Meals on Wheels. So for the month of July, we delivered uh, 601 meals to uh, Manchester residents. Um, we have 47 people enrolled in one of our state home care programs. And this is, um, we also have what's called the uh, AmeriCorp Senior, which is another federal program. It's a volunteer-based program. And there, in FY24, there were 18 uh, residents of Manchester who volunteered in some capacity um, at senior care to the total of um, 1,068 hours of volunteer services. So kudos to your residents who have volunteered. Um, we also have a, a, through this AmeriCorps Senior, is volunteer medical transportation. So in FY 24, there were 19 round trips provided to Manchester residents to get them to their um, doctor's appointment or specialist appointments, physical therapy, uh, etc. Um, 
I guess the, the last thing I'd, I'd like to tell you about is that, and Abby does this as well, is that we offer something called Dementia Friends. It's a one hour, one hour presentation on signs and symptoms of depression and kind of reframing depression in terms of how we, we think and we behave and you know, act around folks who may have some sort of uh, cognitive impairment. And we have provided this training, um, for instance, in Gloucester, uh, the mayor wanted all of the citizen facing staff to have this one hour uh, presentation. So we did it for them. Rockport did um, all of their town employees as well as first responders. We've done first responders in Hamilton as well. So I wanted you to be aware that that's something that's also available uh, to you folks should, should you want that. Um, in our home care program, our various programs, um, in the month of July, we have uh, 75 residents of Manchester that were currently, or at least in July, that we were servicing. Um, I guess the best advice I can give to you is simply to call us. Um, you know, the majority of our services are free. Um, you know, we offer caregiver support groups via Zoom or in person. Um, on an ongoing basis, we've got that caregiver grant. The only program where there's a co-payment is being in the state home care program, unless you're on Mass Health, in which case there is no copay. But I will say in the state home care programs is that we're very generous, and it's based upon a person's income. The state sets the amounts, but we're very generous in terms of lowering the copay, and the copay gets in the way of somebody accepting the help that that they need. Um, we'll go as far as just say we'll just waive it. You know, because we know that they need the help. I've, uh, I'll close out here. I've, I ask uh, all the groups that I'm meeting with is what do you folks see as the needs of older adults uh, in your community? Yeah, well, I, I can. I happen to be the interface person for uh, Council on Aging and the seniors here in town. And I'll say that their hot button right now is transportation, and I was curious. I have been in touch. I don't know who your transportation person was, but I spoke with them, I don't know, three, three months ago, find out what the story is. The challenge you have is the challenge that so many communities have. You need drivers. Yes. And he said, yeah, in the summer, it's not so bad. In the winter, it's tough because a lot of people go to Florida. <laughs> At least your drivers do. Okay. So it's, it's a problem. But you'll take people lots of places, and I know a couple of people who have used your service here. You say, I guess, for fiscal year, you've done 19 round trips. I know at least one person who has been among those 19. We're always exploring new ways, and I know that your focus is all on health care. Okay, so, but that's the majority of the trips, I think, that that demographic takes. Absolutely. And we're always looking for more choices and alternatives for uh, transportation for our seniors. But I'm, I, in general, I'm impressed with the long list you've got here. That 601 did jump out at me for this Meals on Wheels. Is there a distinction between nutrition Meals on Wheels and just Meals on Wheels, or by definition, all of your meals are nutritious? All of our meals are, in fact, nutritious. And we have, we have um, very strict guidelines that the feds set I can't believe uh, that. On wheels program, which you know is nationwide. Um, so we have, they have to be uh, presented and cooked in a certain way, and there has to be, you know, a balance between vitamins and minerals and protein and fats and carbohydrates. Um, our nutrition department um, handles all of that. So we do have a nutritionist on site uh, and staff who also does home visits and can do nutrition counseling as well. Well, it's 20 meals a day. I think that's pretty good. <laughs> that's a lot of people who are taking advantage of that, so that's great. I know that um, Nancy and the Council on Aging, they get this pretty pretty high profile in terms of the programs they've got down there. It's advertised uh, in their uh, monthly newsletter, which is here, you're probably aware, et cetera. So it's good, and hopefully the programs continue to grow. You've got an awful lot of them. Medical transportation drivers, uh, during the pandemic, they continued to bring people to essential appointments. That, and we honored them, you know, every year we have our annual celebration. Last week it was our 52nd. And during the pandemic, we actually honored them and the Council on Aging 
uh, directors as well for the work that they did, you know, during the height of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. and these people were stars, you know, driving people to appointments. We offered to, to get them plexiglass for the back of, you know, the, the back seat. Yeah, because it's their own cars. They didn't want them, their yeah. own cars. Um, and they were super committed to making sure people got the medical care that they needed. Do you need anything from us? No, I don't think so. Just spread the word. Um, you know, any any questions anybody calls, like I said, the the most important thing is just call us. You know, the, figuring out health care is, is so difficult. Um, the other thing that we have to know is that um, we have something called options counseling, which is actually available to anybody 22 and over with a disability. So that's the one service that we offer um, for younger adults as well. And it's short term, and the options counselor kind of lays out the options, you know, and sort of uh, empowers the person to make their own own decision as to which way they want to go with respect to either themselves or um, someone that they're caring for. Mm -hmm. okay. Madam Chair, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yes, great, Scott. Thank you, yep. thank thank you, you very, very much. much. Set the stage for. The stage for. Um, so our, our next topic is um, a potential uh, land conservation deal that uh, Essex County Greenbelt has been championing, working hard on. We have Chris LaPointe here with us tonight, who's president of Essex Greenbelt, and can walk us through some of the details. Um, it involves lands um, uh, in the eastern part of town, uh, the Long Hill area and uh, some of the lands uh, extend over into Gloucester, so it's, it's lands that are both in Manchester and in Gloucester. Um, overall, it's a, it's a $3 million um, purchase of land and uh, placement of conservation easements on those lands to permanently protect them. Um, the request that Greenbelt has before our Community Preservation Committee is for $250,000 to go towards um, the total cost of that $3 million. The other uh, monies, um, Chris can walk us through those other funding sources. Um, and so I know that um, Chris has been before both the Open Space Committee and the CPC, oh, I'm sorry, the um, Conservation and Commission, the and plan. last night the uh, Planning Board, all three of those um, Boards or committees have voted to endorse the project, um, and uh, Chris is slated to be before the CPC uh, this Thursday to talk more. Right against the MPTA zoning. It'll be before that. They're earlier. I think. Um, there are five. Exactly. There are five, and um, the others at seven. Uh, that seven? Exactly. Exactly. Um, so with that, I think I'll turn it over to Chris. I know that Mark. Uh, Mark Resnick, our town planner, has been um, intimately involved. He walked the property area um, and has been working with, with Chris, setting up uh, <laughs> meetings, have, agendas, and that sort of thing. And do we have the ability to put his um, maps on the screen? Uh, yes. I do have copies of Basically, yeah. you have copies in your yeah. but um, we're also worried about the recording and, and people yeah. who aren't here. Let me open it up and give you a uh, while I'm doing that. Uh, Chris, Why don't you go ahead? Yes. Can you, uh, Good evening. Uh, Greg has done a wonderful job uh, introducing this, but if, just for the record, Chris LaPointe, president of Essex County Greenbelt. Uh, I, I think you probably all know who Greenbelt is, but if not, we're the Land Trust of Essex County. We're headquartered over in Essex. We own uh, about 80 acres of land in Manchester and about 150 acres of conservation restrictions. We've been a, a partner with the town, a partner with Manchester Essex Conservation Trust and others locally for, for years. We're an organization with a mission to conserve land as working farmland, wildlife habitat, scenic resources, places that people can recreate. Uh, 
hopefully you visited some of our properties around the county. All our land is open to the public, free of charge. Um, as Greg laid out, Greenbelt has the opportunity to acquire 330 acres of land from De Normandy that is uh, partially in Manchester and partially in Gloucester. So for those of you who've been in town for a long time, you may recall in the late 1990s, there was a significant conservation effort, essentially the first phase of this project, which protected 120 acres of the Manchester land. Um, De Normandy, who we're now buying the land from, was essentially the conservation buyer in that transaction. And most, but not all, of the Manchester acreage was protected in that effort. So 30 acres at the top of Long Hill uh, remains unprotected um, with access from Colburn Road. After that initial transaction, um, that same landowner acquired another 180 acres on the Gloucester side of the line from Boston, Maine. Those two parcels together, those, those multiple parcels, but those that acreage together totals our entire project area. Uh, as you are probably aware, this, this area um, uh, is directly adjacent to about 1,400 acres of land that includes Gloucester watershed land, includes Cranberry Pond, and, and, and a significant area that protects the headwaters of Cap Brook and Wolf Trap Brook as, it, as, as we roll up towards 128. There's about eight miles of trails on just the land that we have under contract, and that connects into about a, at least a 20-mile trail network that um, exists before you hit roads. So it's, it's truly a regional resource. Um, as Greg described, Greenbelt has the, the property under contract for $3 million. We've been fortunate to amass a pretty significant amount of money already. So we received a $1.1 million grant from the state through the Landscape Partnership Program that, that will fund all of the land in both Manchester and Gloucester. Um, and we've, we've raised substantial funds either through invitations to apply to foundations or other private monies that we've, we've raised. We're essentially down to about a $500,000 funding gap between monies that we've raised or have identified and have a high likelihood where we need to get to that, that um, $3 million total purchase price. Um, our proposed project structure is that Greenbelt would own all of the land. So we would manage it, would be responsible for maintenance and stewardship, make sure the trails are cleared and there's good signage and appropriate parking forever. Um, and uh, in, in Gloucester, the city has agreed to hold a conservation restriction over the land that we'll own in Gloucester. The late 1990s portion of the project, that conservation restriction is and will continue to be held by Manchester Essex Conservation Trust. But the request before the town of Manchester is uh, whether there's a willingness to invest in the project and to hold a conservation restriction over the land that is presently unprotected on the Manchester side. So about 30 acres of land at the top of Long Hill. Um, that piece of the property by itself, the conservation restriction on that land by itself has been appraised, and we've shared the appraisals with the CPC, has been appraised by itself at $1.35 million. So we're asking the town to consider an investment of $250,000 towards a conservation restriction that's been valued at $1.35 million. Um, I know you have a lot on the agenda this evening and may have questions, so I will, I will pause there. I'm happy to take questions or to go in uh, to further detail on <coughs> any and all of this. So it might be helpful, Chris, if you could just use the screen yeah. there and just sort of outline sure. <laughs> um, what, what we're talking about here. So we have everything in, in red under agreement, and I realize the map is confusing because of the, layout, the lot layouts. So in Gloucester, all of this acreage that is knitted together with existing conserved land that the city owns. This is the town line. This is the Rockport line. The, Sorry, railroad. the railroad. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. The railroad. Uh, Cooper Trask off of Magnolia. Colburn Road, uh, Dexter Pond Conservation Area. 
Touch the screen. screen. Shoot. <laughs> Colburn Road comes up here. Yeah. There are presently uh, presently parking at Dexter Pond, and presently two to three additional parking areas that exist that folks use to access the trail system on this part of Long Hill presently. So we would be acquiring everything in red. The request would be for the town to consider holding a conservation restriction over this acreage at the top of Long Hill and a strip along the railroad tracks. But this is the this is the main the main event. Um, again, because the map is a little confusing, that, just a reminder: this that square is owned by the town. So that was part of the initial project in the late 1990s. I believe the town acquired that. Um, Potentially for a yeah, what is that water tower? I, I don't know the full. It was, it was identified as a future site for another oh. water tank. Okay. And that has easements and otherwise, so that's that's that would be un, unaffected by the conservation project. What is that long strip that comes out? This piece? <clears throat> yeah. Um, I would need to look back at my title report, but that is just a that's a a parcel that is not owned by this owner. That's a um, it's either owners unknown or it's more research needs to be done to uh, figure out who the private owner is. Probably one of those old wood lots. <laughs> yeah. Most of these are, I mean, you can see what the I mean, just the is. shape of it looks like some kind of right of way or something like that. Mm -hmm. But these are, see, these are all that same pattern. These, yeah. these oh, are right. all these old wood lots that are stacked up together. So there's a plan from the late 1800s that has this, this entire thing is plotted out like, like that. I guess the first question would be, does the CPC have the money? So the answer to that is yes. Is that going to affect things like the Sweeney? Uh, Sweeney is uh, the best, probably not going to get to this year's budget, but uh, certainly going to affect, I don't know how much uh, bathhouse renovations. And again, this is just the preliminary discussions. I don't think any. Nate's got involved as far as coming up with budgeting as far as they're just identifying what they have some capital projects I want to address. For your information, generally we do this sort of thing at the annual town meeting um, because there are lots of capital projects sure. and, and many of them qualify for CPC funds and it's Personally, it makes me a little uncomfortable because I have this much money right now. Um, can you go ahead with the purchase if Manchester says we'll let you know in April? So I should explain for everyone the, the timing constraint and the reason that we're asking for the, the unusual mm -hmm. request to uh, go to a, a fall meeting, and that is that there's really two issues. One, we have a, a contract deadline that is just after the first of the year. That's that's one point. The the almost the more important point is that the entire project needs to be closed before the end of June in order to use the state money. So regardless of whether we got an, an extension to closing with the landowner that we're buying from, we still need to have everything closed by the end of June. Um, the, the challenge that I see um, with us going forward and buying the property, waiting for annual town meeting, is that I, I think it's a difficult um, story to tell that Greenbelt has purchased the property mm -hmm. and then three months later we're going to Manchester town meeting and asking for money to help with that purchase. Um, I, there's there's no better way to say it than that. That's just that that's that would be a challenge. So that would have that would be a a risk that we would have to be willing to take. And it would also I just think it it's uh, it's hard for us to go forward with a purchase without knowing that we have the funding lined up. And I think it's also a challenging um, situation to explain to voters why they're being asked three months after we've bought the land. So I. I, I think it's a I think it's a challenge. I, I, I hear you loud and clear on the, the discomfort about the timing and I appreciate that very much and you know 
understand that this this board will. Yeah, I, I'm also that. uncomfortable with the timing. To be honest with you, um, two reasons. One, you know, it's hard. You've done. A, I appreciate the education on, on what you're trying to do because I probably needed that anyway if we were going to uh, talk CPC funding. But we usually get a list of things, and part of um, what I think, CP, you know, the CPA and the select board discusses. Out of all the good ideas that people have, right, um, which ones make the cut? So without knowing what else is a potential request for CPC funding, you know, how do I know this is the best use of, of the town funds? Why, why would I endorse this over something else that may um, also be worthwhile? I just I don't know what else is on the CPC. If I could respond. Yeah. Oh, of course. Just, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. That's, a, that's, a, that's a fair question. And, and, and I think in, um, in, in my world, we're asked constantly, um, how, how do you decide what projects are going to work on? Right? Mm -hmm. And we might have a list of 100 of the greatest properties in Essex County in rank order. Um, but it's almost never the case that number one through five come up next year. Right, it's we might we might have number ten and number seventeen, and they're still really good, and we can assess them on their own merits, because we know that all of this work, the timing of the bathhouse, the opportunity to buy real estate, when permits are going to be ready to do X Y Z project, it's both priority and opportunity. And so with with real estate, and this is one of the challenges. You know, I know a, a lot of communities have exceptions to their normal. Most folks want to bring, most towns want to bring things in the spring, and that's understandable. A lot of places also sort of acknowledge the, the, the realities of real estate is it's sort of available when it's available. Right. So, yeah. I, so your concern is, 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 is very well founded, and it's also, it's, um, I feel like in the, the length of time that I've been doing this, when properties like this are available, there's a there's a need to sort of assess them on their on their merits. I guess my other question would be, what are other uses for the land? I mean, is it something that we would never use for another purpose anyway, and that's why it's also a good reason to put well, it under conservation? Okay, we don't. That, that right. So, so if we were to purchase it, or um, I mean, the land probably is its highest and best use is, is residential. Um, and as you know, that old Colburn neighborhood of pretty high-end homes, mm -hmm. um, and you could expand uh, into that into those thirty acres. Um, I think that's why the CR appraised as high as it did. Right. Um, in terms of other town uses, I, given its sort of distant location, and I don't see. Other municipal uses. So, so the then basically, though, if it wasn't put under conservation, it would likely be its likely use would be higher end homes. Yes, okay, that's kind of. Yeah. should have asked my question. Yeah. better. Um, <laughs> and I think I would. I, traditionally, we have been using CP, CPA funds for relatively small projects, um, and I think. Uh, from my perspective, I think it's better to use those funds for sort of legacy projects. Um, and I think this disqualifies clearly for that. This is a, a pretty significant legacy project. Um, and one of the primary goals in the master plan, as, as well as the CPC plan, is to make sure we're conserving important lands. Um, we have a target. For in the, was it nine square miles we have in? Town? Yeah, so the target is around forty percent of your land mass. Okay, and what are we at? Now? We're in the in the mid thirties, which is pretty darn good. Right. Okay. <laughs> That's kind of um, what I was getting at. We're we're we <clears throat> we have a good conservation base of land already. Um, uh, sort of the national go that that the current administration targeted was forty percent. Um, and many communities have adopted that as a goal. We haven't formally adopted that as a goal. We, we state in our master plan that 
you know, we want to make sure we're conserving important lands. Um, we didn't put a numerical target on that in the master plan that I'm remembering. Um, I guess I should double check, but I'm not remembering that we put a numerical target. Um, but we, when we have talked about it, we have talked about and you know, and wanted to increase our holdings. Um, so I understand this is out of cycle, um, but I do think it's an opportunity that it's important to to seriously consider when that opportunity is before us. When does everyone have to get their request into it? By the end of the year, right? Yes. Yeah. First of December, I think, is their deadline. First of December, so would you be comfortable revisiting this in the middle of December? This is a, a time we but it has yeah, to, but I'm saying, but we have a better idea of what people are asking for. I think what I'm saying is they're looking for our support to have this on the warrant for the November to yeah, meeting. Yeah, they want this in November. That's what I yeah. think. Because right, they're hoping they need to, um, they need to close by the, well, they need to. I hear, I hear what Anne's and concerns out. My question is at roughly so, a little over $9,000 an acre, what do we get in return? We're basically, I'd, I'd like to see somehow the town maintaining about 25 to 27 acres of land that we can use at a later time, as you point uh, out. I think that's not an option. This is a purchase from a single owner who's offered it to the Green I understand Bell that, but then I the want whole thing. I, I'd like to explore what we could do Basically, $250,000 is a lot of money. And I'd like to see some kind of return on investment. All right, I don't know if the Green Belt can then seed it back, you know, sell it back to us for a dollar with the idea that it's going to be, that the town will maintain restrictions on the land but not put it into conservation trust until such time as we may need to put it into a conservation trust as a trade off with the state. Well, you're not, you're not paying full rate on the land to begin with. Well, the, the, the price has been established at right, roughly, I don't know if you across the board, it's a little over $9,000 an acre. I'm that's just thinking that we can... That's the... We've, we've started with... Blended. The blended we blended blended. We started with a purchase price and we've funded nearly all of it in the... In the and so the request we're able to make to the town is a, is a fraction of the value of the thing that you would be right, buying. You're buying it for $3 million. Everything. 330 acres of land for $3 million. Correct. $9,000 an acre. Right, but the, the, you can imagine the land in Gloucester that doesn't have development access is, isn't $9,000. I'm just trying acre. to come up with a number that's palatable, okay? My concern, and although I think it's been addressed for the short term, is that we discussed last month that we can't expand Newport Park because we don't have any land to trade the state, mm -hmm. okay? For was it one by one for three, three for one, as far yeah, as trading yeah, that? Typical, right. and, right. and, and we don't have any. We don't. We don't have that ability. I would like to maintain. I think working with Greenbelt to hold on to something that we can use. Mm -hmm. Right. I think the point is we don't own. Right. Okay. Land. Well, I want to know how we can. You're asking how we can. Would that be something that you would entertain? If we give you two hundred fifty thousand dollars, we want the right to be able to. Yeah, um, I will. So, I want the right so, to be so able that's, to use that. I appreciate where you're coming from on that. I, I don't think that's a, a, a an arrangement we would we would want, want to do. The the funding from the state for the landscape partnership program is to acquire all of this acreage and permanently protect it. So it's it's, a, it's it, the purchase. The purpose of the purchase is to not. Build anything no, we're not, on it I don't care if I buy if you give me deeded rights to walk wetlands that we can't build on. Okay. All right. Or you transfer it with deed restrictions. As long as there's no conservation trust on it, that we can then apply a conservation trust later on if we're looking to trade land with the state. You're saying hold off on the conservation trust at time of purchase exactly. so we could use it as a card exactly. to play with the state later I want, on. I want to put something in the bank. Does that make sense? So y'all, y'all, it ends up in the same place anyway. It's yeah. all going to end up. In I think it's just I think the, the challenge I think that uh, we have here is is, is the, the bulk of the other funding has strings attached to it, right? So 
I don't know if we can work with those strings. <laughs> um, we can we can pursue it a little further and kick the can on that tire, just or kick that tire a little harder. To, um, we heard this last. Using month. the wrong metaphor here. But anyway, <laughs> I think from our from our standpoint, so we so I appreciate the consideration of the request that we made. Um, Two point seven five million of the other dollars are coming to this project to permanently protect the whole thing. So that's the, the challenge is the is that there is momentum behind that concept. And I think the I appreciate where you're coming from on this, but I think the, the logistics of that um, I, I'm happy to think about further, but I, I might might not be Again, I, my point is if there's, if you put a deed restriction that can't be developed short of a conservation restriction on it and allow that parcel of land, whatever it is, at 20 or 25 acres, that Manchester still would have the ability to trade off later on down the road by putting a conservation, by putting it to conservation trust. Again, maybe this, yeah. maybe, I don't know, yeah. just, yeah. We, we, have, we have other issues. We have housing issues here. Well, I, I, I guess okay. that, that what you're getting at is, you know, we are a small town, right? Mm -hmm. And we have lots of land needs. And, and the fact that we're over 30% conservation is really good. Yes, yes. Personally, I would feel a lot more comfortable if we had an actual target. What do we want to conserve? Um, and then you develop a plan to, you know, to, to conserve the amount of land until you reach your target. If we don't have a real target that the town has agreed on, it's, it's a little... It's a more... It's more it's more vague than, than a concrete number. I mean, so the master plan identifies the Western Woods area, yeah. the Gordon Woods area, and this eastern part of town. So this specific section was identified yes. in the master plan as something that the residents wanted to conserve. Yes. So those, those are the three areas of town where it was identified that additional conservation efforts were desired. We, we, we stopped short in the master plan my recollection of putting a, an acreage or, or percentage number. And so since since the adoption of the master plan, um, we've done the one parcel, the um, Christian Hill parcel in the Western Woods. Um, that, was a, that was a... It was a little bit locked away and not much could be done there anyway, right? Yeah. So that was a little bit of an easier call. Yes. Whereas this... If we needed land for something and somebody had the ability to sell it to us, that's a more difficult call. Again, I'm not advocating yeah. developing any of this land. Right. No, I understand. Okay. I just want to be able so to I, use this okay. land to develop something else later. I, I, I have a question. All, all of this land is owned by DeNormandy, right? Yes. And this is an all or none proposition that DeNormandy is promoting or, or requiring? In other words, you either get it all or you get none of it. We're interested in buying all of it. He's interested in selling all of it. Okay. But it's not like you could go ahead with 270 acres or 200. You want to get as much as you can. Yeah. Um, and you've got this grant, this, I don't, I don't know. I mean, the whole deal is $3 million. My, my other question is, so r right now you certainly want to get as much as you can, but there's, it's, it's not like black and white. You either get, buy all 330 acres or I'm not talking to you anymore. Is that the situation? If, if Manchester didn't fund didn't the piece that you were... So our, our goal, if... if I understand our, what your goal is. Our preferred strategy is to partner with Manchester sure. on putting this funding together. Obviously, if, if the CPC doesn't advance this, if this board doesn't advance it, if the town meeting rejected it, we would, we would work to raise money from any other source we could find between that town meeting and closing to work to acquire the land. We wouldn't immediately give up, but... Oh, uh, when you say for other money sources, I mean, if this land is not part of that, why then maybe you need less money? Yeah, we're not, we're not, we're not looking to carve pieces out of it. I understand. I understand. My second, my second question is, you've got um, a list of your revenue sources, but you don't have a list of your revenue uses. In other words, you've got three million bucks, and this is where this money is coming from. Right, that's our use. We're buying all of the land for three million dollars. There, are, there isn't a. You can't break it down. Three million dollars is a check that's written to Denormandy. That's the end of it. 
we have a we have a, a single contract that addresses all of this acreage right. with a three million dollar purchase price. Okay, so three million dollars not only gets you the land, but it also puts it in the conservation. I mean, conservation is something you're doing. You're just acquiring the land, and then you're going to turn around and put it into conservation, right? I'm not completely following the question. We're we're are those two separate steps? You buy the land. I now own the land. We're going to buy and own the land. And then the next we're day, convey, the next day, the same day, we're going to convey a conservation restriction right. over land that we own to Gloucester. And if Manchester is a partner, we would convey a conservation restriction to Manchester. Understood. Okay. So the three million dollars all goes to Normandy for the acquisition of three hundred and thirty. Yeah. Okay. That's what I needed to kind of understand. I thought there were other things, like no, I'm no, paying sorry. North to Normandy $2 million. I got to use $100,000 for the state to do something. Sorry, no, I, was, I was, that's a perfectly reasonable question that I was misunderstanding. Okay, all right, so I understand <laughs> the number. So it's $3 million, and I understand it's difficult to know how much each acre is worth, because these have different values, depending upon where you are. Right. We, it's been appraised, but it's not parsed out. Uh, understood. I mean, and as, as Brian was saying, $250,000, I don't know how many. In Manchester, at the top of Colburn Road, how much money, how many oh, acres does no, that I get? I want to buy some wetlands somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe what you get. The cheapest land I can get as long as I can have a parcel that at some point, if we identify some other land that we can put affordable housing on, but is buffered by current mm -hmm. conservation yeah, we, we've got a, a particular we, problem that we're kind of right, focused right. on, and I'm not sure that this is a solution yeah. to that problem. But I, I, I think it's a good question. I think it is. Okay. <laughs> but uh, 250000 I think that's probably the largest, well, you'll find out, I think that's the largest request that CPC's had for any project in its 20-year history. It may be. Um, so we've been funding the affordable housing. Yeah, that's two hundred. That's kind of automatic months. every year yeah, but for a few yeah. years. But just. so we, um, assuming the state matches in that twenty percent range, our total annual revenue on CPC is around six hundred, six hundred fifty thousand. Um, um, I don't know the exact number in the bank right now, but it's it's in excess of the two hundred fifty. Hmm. Um, Jack just raised his hand, so he may know that number offhand. Hi, everybody. Jack Burke, CPC. We have uh, 450000 in the bank right now. Okay. Thank you, Jack. Yep. Um, what about other projects? I mean, I guess that's my concern, is I don't want to... I'm all about conserving land, but... Is this going to take away from other projects that residents need? So, like I say, with with 600, 600 plus coming in every year, and if we have four hundred fifty in the bank, this would leave two hundred in the bank. Um, so that would give you eight hundred thousand to work with for for FY twenty six, and and we have typically spent in the. Four to five hundred range each year. And we don't foresee any anything going over that. Nothing right. coming up. That includes the two hundred fifty thousand dollars annually to uh, for the housing trust. Yes. Yeah. So from from a, if history is any guide, I'm I'm, I'm not worried about um, losing that two fifty and and risking other projects. Okay, that was that's my main. Um, obviously, if if some other big project you know presented itself tomorrow, um, we you know that, that, there's always there's that nothing risk. on the horizon. There's nothing on the that's horizon. Right. There's nothing in the works. Not that in would... the affordable housing area, because like I, you know, my big concern is our biggest problem is housing right now. We're if I look at. How much land we've conserved versus how much housing we have produced. Okay, right. Our, we've done great we're on the conservation under, we're, we're side, out of balance. Not, not conservation side, and we have not done enough. And so, my personal preference was, you know, is there any way we could increase the amount of funding through CP the CPA funds 
to really get something done on affordable housing. I know we're going to be discussing it again in a couple of is it next, uh, is it November or something? Um, that's my real hesitation here. I'm not worried about, you know, the parks and rec stuff we do and, and all that other stuff, but we are woefully behind on housing. I, I don't need to yeah. under, my, yeah. under, undercut that at all, yeah. Yeah. but frankly, 250000 is not going to make or break no. an affordable housing That's project. True. That is true. Um, it takes a lot more than that. I mean, to really fund affordable housing, we may have to consider increasing the CPC surcharge. You know, that's a whole different topic of conversation. Or devoting an entire year's worth of, you know, if you have 800000 you know. Right. Or use, yes, six to 800000 a bond. Right. That's what I'm saying. Is, is this uh, taking the two hundred fifty out, is that going to prevent us from doing something meaningful on affordable housing because the the chipping in 250k a year isn't getting us where we need mm -hmm. and that's why i'm worried about losing even more because we're, we're falling behind okay so i, I think i think the chances yeah. that we're going to be able to increase yeah. the contribution to the affordable housing trust mm -hmm. next spring is not great mm -hmm. um that people are already questioning it yeah but you could, you could yeah. use you could take okay. half so this, of those monies and bond yeah, and, this, and, and lock in that 300000 a year for a 10-year bond. But this, yeah. this particular project really doesn't affect that one way or the other. That I, ability. I don't feel that it does. Mm -hmm. I, I think you still have that option. So even even if we approve this tonight, it's still contingent on CPC passing it, right? See, yes, the committee uh, has to approve it before it can go before the voters. Um, and so it's, and then you would have to vote to put it on the warrant. We're, we're not being asked to approve anything tonight. It's more endorsing it as it goes forth to see. This is to let us express our opinions, okay. understand where we stand. The we're CPC will do what they do. Right, exactly. They will come back to us and say they want it on if, if they approve it. They mm -hmm. want it on the warrant, warrant mm -hmm. for no, November 18th. Okay. And then we get to decide. Whether that puts anything else at risk that we think is even more important. Um, Chris, uh, you, you mentioned, as Brian had mentioned, somehow using that land to leverage uh, our ability to put land in conservation under Manchester's name rather than under your name. Under your name, it doesn't do us any good other than the fact that it is conserved land. But you know the point that he was making, and we're all here on the, on the select board are aware of the challenge we have on that. Can you make some phone calls on that and find out how that might? Well, you need, maybe, you maybe. need land that's, if I understand, municipally owned but unprotected, like not with a deed restriction, Correct. not with a conservation restriction, not committed to the Conservation Commission or anything else in order to, to swap because you're trying to take some other land out of Article 97. Is that the, yep. the gist that's, of it? That's I was just about to explain that. Right. Yes. So, so right. Um, so, for the, yeah, for the reasons I've described, I think this one is challenging for that profile. But I, um, if you happen to run across something like that, let us. <laughs> what's the amount? What's the amount of acreage that you're? Yeah. you're One acre. Uh, we might want to follow. It's probably under an acre. But uh, you know, today's information indicated that we we could probably do it without using that particular. I, I understand that, but I'd like to have five acres in our pocket. I'd love to have 30 eggs in our pocket, but it's something I want to have so we don't have to go through this again. You know, yes, you took a walk over Newport Park. Yes. Okay. But as a developer comes in and starts to look at helping out, he might want to start, oh, that works over here. Okay. With a developer's mindset, he's going to look at that and say, but I do need something over here. Oh, that's under conservation trust. We can't, even if it's, hundred feet into the uh, into the buffer, okay, to make it uh, a project that a developer can work with, and I want to have that luxury be able to do that. I, I understand. understand. It doesn't sound like this project is well, that is I'm the road. Sure this project gives us that vehicle. Right. <laughs> That's. Um, 
have is there anyone online who wants to speak? I saw Jack's hand earlier. He says, I'm not, I'm not I seeing it. Okay. My suggestion <coughs> is, is that I think we know the questions, the opportunities that we wait and see what the CPC, mm -hmm. perhaps several of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mark, do you have something you'd like to add? Um, no, I mean, uh, I think Chris has explained the project quite well. Um, I understand your concern about trying to have some land that could be traded. I think as it relates particularly to Newport Park, it, <clears throat> there's a lot of development constraints on that land and the um, Newport uh, out of House Hill uh, property that's concerned. So I think the opportunity there really lies within property that's already owned by the housing authority. Um, so we are in the process of having that survey and having wetlands delineated so we can have more information <coughs> moving forward. So but I don't think realistically <coughs> that's the property that you're going to probably try and get a uh, new swap on um, just because of the condition of the surrounding land there. So. Um, it doesn't hurt to, like you say, for the town to acquire some extra land at some point in case there are other opportunities that we need to uh, unrestrict or um, and do a swap in the future. So, again, um, that's a project that we need to work on to work towards as well. But that's kind of different than. So. I think without having a report from the CPC, um, we just need to come back at our next meeting. Mm -hmm. And and I mean, the CONCOM, I, I, when I first heard of this, I assumed it would be a tremendous push to get all of the boards that have to approve it, to look at it and approve it. Um, but the CONCOM is there, the planning board is there, the open space and recreation is there. Um, so there seems to be a lot of support in town for this. And leave it at that. We'll come back and and decide whether this is something that if if the contract says it's not going to CPC says if they want to spend the money, then we need to talk about the answers on the Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. When's the CPC? Was that Thursday? Thursday. Yeah. That's fine. It's been a lot of time here. How big is that little <laughs> square there that is for a water tower? Oh, it might be an eight. About an inch and a half. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want to say it's a little. It's an acre, or a little over an acre. I, I was, it's it's in that area. One, okay. one to two acres. Okay. Would be my guess. Well, there you go. There's your acre. <laughs> One, 25 acres. I want to see a nice return on my investment. Okay, we we have we we have people waiting for us, and we're we're half an hour late at this point. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. One point zero three acres. Yeah, right on. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> That's what an inch square gets you. <laughs> Please come in. I'm sorry we're we're so late. Are we finally up? You are yes. finally up. Yay! Yes. Hey, nice. Get in here. Excuse me, I have scrambled my notes. And Julie's and Jazz. Where would you like us? Anywhere. Okay. Um, can so, yeah, we have, we have two, uh, two candidates for the welcome. Committee, mm -hmm. um, Julie Tassi and Jen De Simone. Did yes. I say that? Yeah. Um, and, and so they're here to uh, to be interviewed and, mm -hmm. and see what you think. There's one position. No, there are multiple oh, positions. We have to find it out. <laughs> <laughs> if, there are, if there are multiple positions, uh -huh. fine. That, yeah. That, oh yeah. 
Yes. yes, definitely. You're not fighting with each other. Yes, yes. no. no. <laughs> I was just. Okay. Julie, I'm not, I'm could you start? I'm, for, I'm Julie. Okay. Yes. What would you like to know? I would like to know a little bit about, about you and why you think you are a good fit for the uh, welcome committee. Okay. Well, I grew up in Manchester, moved away, moved back about 14 years, of, years ago. My kids went to school here and I've been on different committees throughout the town, never on a town committee, but different different board and committees, Boy Scouts, Church, the Community Center, and um, PTA, PTOs, and I'm ready to, my kids are grown, I'm ready to give my time. Talk Good, to you. yeah. Welcome back, Julie. I don't think I've seen you in a couple of years or so. I know, I know you're to see you too. in touch with my wife from time to time. I am, I am. <laughs> So that's that's great to hear. Have you been in touch? Who's chair of the uh, welcoming committee? Is that Leslie or? It is. I'm not sure if it's Leslie or um, Christine. Yeah. Christine. Yeah, I wasn't Leslie sure. Leslie stepped down. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Christine reached Christine. out to me and asked me to. Oh, great. I was I was was with her on the Boy Scouts. We were committee members in the Boy Scouts for okay, many good. years. So. Good. Good. So you had a chance to chat with her a little bit. Yes, I actually. Um, went and met with both of them already and they told me you know gave me the overview of what they're doing and they have an agenda for the next for the meeting tomorrow night and they reached out mm -hmm. to other people to get them involved as well so all right any 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 particular unique uh, I mean welcoming is hey if you like to meet new people you're in <laughs> so uh, is there uh, anything in particular that you want to kind of get involved with with this committee or just see I how just it want to help out. It sounds like they they need help and they need bodies, and I'm willing to do that. Whatever they need done, be a soldier. <laughs> Great. Having a being want, wanting wanting to participate is the number one number one criteria for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Questions? I've I've known Julie for a couple of years, and I appreciate her husband on the basketball club. Mm -hmm. I think. Uh, She's well qualified. She's got her, her, her roots in the town. Would be yeah. Yeah, no, I don't really have anything. Okay. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. So um, again, Jen Desimone, and I've been here four years, but I come from. I have, gosh, since the late. 1800s, early 1900s, my great grandparents were here, my grandparents, my mom was raised here. So I kind of found my way back here about four years ago um, and love it. And I can never, you know, can never imagine leaving. So I've just loved it ever since. I've tried to volunteer wherever I could. And um, I was on the Council on Aging for a time for three years um, in a conflict of interest with a new job. So I had to pull off of that. but. Um, I do try to volunteer on other committees, you know, pancake breakfast, the 4th of July parade. Um, I coach kids, girls on the run, um, young children, not prisoners. Um, <laughs> I came the first spring I came here, and I just, I saw this on Facebook that they were looking for help, and it's just right up my alley. So I can't wait to be part of it if I'm able. Again, I, I've known Jen for a couple of years, walking dogs and start out. And, uh, she's been uh, serving at the Pancake Breakfast a couple of years now. So uh, her commitment is... Do I get extra strawberries if we put them out? <laughs> <laughs> no, they sound really get cranky. This year they get cranky. We didn't run out of last year, two years ago. Every now, year, so. whatever I'm serving, they seem to run out. Yeah, you can, <laughs> she does have a heavy hand. She does yeah. have a heavy yeah. hand. Yeah. control. Yes. Now I know who to go to. Yeah. 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 I am looking for a motion. Uh, I move that the select board appoint Julie Tossi to the welcoming committee for a term until it's fine on June 30th, 2026. Second. Sure. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. Kathy yes. And says yes. 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 Okay. Is there another one? Yep. Uh, I move that the select board appoint Jen DeSimone to the welcoming committee for a term to expire on June 30th, 2026. Second. John. Yes. Anne says yes. 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 
Excellent. Thank you Thank for you. being patient. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. All right. What about okay. the meeting? Tomorrow night? Tomorrow night. Yes. Yes. Right. yes. yes. Start right, right off. Okay. Thank you so much. Oh, you. Thank you. You, need, you need to come. You need to come to the town hall and get sworn in. When? Town, town clerk can swear you in as official I'll committee you, members. I'll send you the info tomorrow. Okay. Um, but your you letter need to be, and then. If you're going to a meeting, you won't be members unless you have gone to the town clerk's office and got sworn in. How late are you here? Till five. You can still go to the meeting, you, you just can't vote. You can vote. Okay. Yeah. But you go um, to the meeting. What time do you open in the morning? 8.30. And Thursday nights are open later? Yes. Or, yeah, Thursday nights they're open later. Yeah, but, but this is Wednesday. But this is a Wednesday meeting. meeting. No, I know, I know. Yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah. You, can, you can always attend the meeting if you're not sworn in, but you mm -hmm. can't vote until you are sworn in. Okay. So if for some reason you can't get sworn in before the meeting, mm -hmm. You attend Thursday, the meeting, Thursday. enjoy yourself, and then Thursday gets yeah. one in and, and when their hours are more amenable. <laughs> are you open on Thursday? Six thirty. Six. Oh, yeah. One more question. Okay. Fridays are you open? And you're not open Fridays. No. Mondays? Yes. Maybe these are questions. Maybe perhaps these were questions we should have asked before we appointed you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll eventually get sworn in. Okay, there you go. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Wasn't that supposed to be your question? Well, that was about Becky Jake's channeling, and yeah, I forgot yeah. to do it. <laughs> <laughs> out of sight, out of mind. It's a good question to ask. Okay, the next thing on our agenda is the waterfront event permit discussion, and we have. A bullet point of so yeah, I'm looking for some uh, additional input. If you feel that these are the correct bullet points, or there's ones you would add, would you amend some of the ones that are listed there? Um, and then, assuming you get the right list, then we'll, we can work on kind of a more formal. So, I think the only question I had was, I think this was what we discussed at the um, separate meeting we had um, with Chief Fitzgerald, etc. I'm unclear on the sequence of events, though, um, or the sequence of permitting. So would this permit be reviewed and by whom um, before or after the Coast Guard issues a permit? Before. Or is it con so? This this would can we ensure that the co if the Coast Guard gives the final okay, can we ensure that this permitting process is completed before the Coast Guard, or does the Coast Guard have to give their okay before we would go through the time and trouble of issuing our permit? I'm I'm just and unclear on the process. My understanding and is Coast Guard needs ninety days, and we're asking for one hundred and twenty days for that reason. For that reason, yeah. Yeah. all right. So we want to know 120 days so they can review it and then go to the Coast Guard and get in that 90 day window. Is my understanding. That's the way it sounded. What what constitutes an event? Lots of boats. Oh. The discussion was anything that's advertised. So so any I know that's yeah. So I, I can't I can see where you're going, but yeah. That was the discussion I think, right? Yeah, I think because part of the problem is that the a pop up uh, event on a beautiful Saturday afternoon. Yeah, it was just a bunch of recreational boaters who say, Hey, let's get together. How do you you, you can't you can't you can't uh, you know Right, it wasn't Regular, five, it wasn't yeah. five boats on the weekend. I, I tied forget up. what the discussion was, that, but but Bayon yeah, so. and Chief Fisher were pretty clear on what they thought the definition was. I just can't remember what it is. Um, I, I, I think the first thing yeah. I'd like to see is what is yeah. an event? What's the is it just yeah. on the water, uh, or is it yeah. you know somebody decides to have a bonfire on Lawn on Lawn Beach? No, I think this is strictly. On the, on the water, that's all this applies to. And so basically, it's what's how the many, scope of the proposed permit. How many events 
my, I'm not asking you to answer this, but no, yeah. how many events are there annually that you would expect to fall, that the committee would expect to fall into this category? How many Probably one, one, one maybe two. two. Uh, a couple of years at this point. Yeah. Okay. And I think that the one that we're, that we're, uh, we're drilling down on is not going to happen again. So well, but there was the one from the prior year well, remax. Yeah, there were two of the yeah. 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 And there, there was the uh, misery challenge, but I don't know if that ever will come back or not. Or if that would fall under that purpose. Yeah, that would fall under this. Do I, did, in, and I wasn't at any of the harbor discussions on this, but was um, do other towns have permits? Did we ask other towns, do you have permits, and how do you manage this sort of activity? I mean, somebody must have asked Gloucester because they've got their greasy pole and other stuff. But I'm just wondering if they have a permit process and Schooner. 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 Or the Skinner, you know, and what questions do they ask? I, I don't know. Blessing of the fleet. Yeah. 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 So perhaps you could ask the Harbor Committee for to, to do some. Yeah, Beverly yeah. Gloucester. I don't yeah, think I Essex think probably has one. Well, I think Mayan did ask, but I don't. Yeah, I, I'm just not rec I'm not re remembering the conversation so many weeks or months ago. Yeah. What I personally would like to see is um, if we're in general agreement with some of the stuff, that maybe they ought to just draft the permit, um, what you call it, uh, instructions or whatever, because that would outline the scope of the type of event that requires the permit, the 120 day lead time. You know, if they kind of draft the document. And then maybe we take a look at it. Um, I think we were in general agreement. We need to do something. Um, I just can't remember some of the specifics right now. Let's, well, they apply for a Coast Guard permit. There must be yeah. some sort of guidelines there. I've never even seen the Coast Guard permit. Yeah. It, the, 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 main, the main discussion we had here was because we are such a small town, Everything on this list is pretty doggone expensive. So the, really the purpose yeah. of the permit was to make the event owner pay for it all. And, That's, yeah. and so we know, so we can prepare properly right. staffed right. for right. it, right. right. You know, because for instance, what triggers an EMS detail? Right. Like how many boats? Is it 10 boats? That, and you're absolutely right. What is constitutes an event? And then are there certain... Uh, criteria is so, okay. We've hit this benchmark. Now you're going to need right. uh, an extra boat up. coming down from from Gloucester, uh, an EMS. Okay, so those are the uh, right. things that we still have to. The the, the purpose of it was really to put the onus on the event. Mm -hmm. no, I understand that. Initiator to fund it, plan it, get the resources in. Well, I understand, like the size of the event. Nobody knows. Right. What's Non-boat owner transportation. That was uh, a bunch of uh, zodiacs taking people out to the raft. From like from like running from, people from well, tux uh, you know, from tux yeah, or yeah, then yeah. running and then uh, so there was a lot of basically uh, a shuttle for uh, non basically yeah. a for non boat uh, unsanctioned water shuttle <laughs> shuttles. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so again, to that point. You might have, if you would have said, okay, there were 300 boats there and it was four people per boat, that's not necessarily true because there were a lot of people there that weren't on a boat. Right? Well, they were taken out, in other words, this raft could, I know that there was a band out there, but the raft could support other people than just oh, the band. There was two rafts. There was underwater. <laughs> there, were, there, was, there was, the raft was overloaded. And that was the All right, one. so non-boat order transportation, that's not a one, that's not a one-way plan. That's like, we take them out, yeah, the, bring them back. the guy hey. leaves, and that, hey, hey, it's your problem. <laughs> well, that's okay. And I think that was part of the problem, because I think oh. a, lot of the, a lot of the Zodiacs that may have shuttled two or three people out there were probably overloaded. Well, yeah. And bring them back. Well, they, they just come back, and at the end of the day, hey, I'm done. I'm yeah. talking my boat. I'm going home. And I guess it comes down to maybe a designated driver type situation. Yeah. Oh, that's... You know, I, I went out in one boat. I came back on another boat. Yeah, I understand that. Because so I was bored. A lot of tough home. questions here that are kind of gray. Yeah. No, I think but this is the first. Yeah. I think we just took a first cut at this, That's right? That. Appreciate that. I my other another of my concerns is 
somebody looks at this and says, oh, that looks like a, an annoying set of things to do. I'm not going to do anything. Um, and they just pass the word around. Where does it go from being, you know, a raft of, you know, a raft and six or seven of their friends into something that? Yeah, I this think this is back to the what is an event, right? And yeah, then, I think we need a number. We need a number, but suppose somebody comes in in the middle of the afternoon, and you're suddenly over the number. Okay. I mean, generally though, those people aren't going to be all together. Right, so you're not going to have 300 people all together, oh, if not on purpose. If, if, if your number is 300, then that, that's a different thing. But if your number is 100, you could, or 50. That'd be, what, 15, 20 boats over 100, right? Yeah. And that's not uncommon. That's not, that's, yeah, that's, Usually that's, you see that's an afternoon on the water with a large Andrew family. There, right? so it's, yeah. That's, yeah. So, like oh. I said, we kind of went through all this, and I just am having complete brain fog right now. I, I would like them to more, more thoroughly document the discussion we had at that yeah. hour and a half meeting, or however long it was. Yeah. Because I think we asked all these questions. Um, and I'd like to know what Gloucester Beverly are doing. Okay, and and what what exactly is are we? Requiring that the town acquire um, a jet ski? There is a jet ski in Essex that I think when it skips in. Yeah, I don't. Try it out for a while. I don't there. know that you want to go into capital where, where we type things. At the very bottom of other resources. resources. It was, uh, uh, one of the members brought up the fact that Essex does have a jet ski. Yeah. Whether or not it was, they were advocating to purchase one, acquire one, or at least try one out or borrow one to see how it works. I don't, I'm not quite sure where. Well, we didn't really out. discuss that. What we discussed were just items and around, um, you know, things that the event owners, uh, the event sponsors should make sure are in place, pay for, <clears throat> and be, you know, it says penalty for an unpermitted event. So I, I just think. But the documentation of the discussion needs to be a little richer and more full-bodied for uh, so we don't go revisiting that discussion all over again. We need something, though, so we can, like, you can't shut down something now because you have no rules. Well, that's what I'm saying. We, we went through all this. The meeting right. Brian mm -hmm. and I were at, we went through all of these questions. Like I said, I'm just having complete brain fog. Somebody was taking notes there, and we should have a better representation of the discussion and decisions that were we have Carl, that. Yeah. Uh, back here. Pardon? Sorry. Uh, sorry, did I wake you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, can we get Carl Donan here at some point? Ah, yeah. I, saw, I heard Cal, and I was trying to remind you. We'll see Cal. Carl. I'm sorry. Right. I struggled with that. Peabody boy. <laughs> okay, got it. Um, yeah, I think I'd like, we, we need to revisit this. I don't think we need to revisit this one next meeting. Okay. I would maybe have to maybe we spring, maybe. spring time meeting. I mean, I have to fall time meeting. Um, I'm not sure that a permit, I'm not sure that that's a town meeting. No, no, but after, but let's after revisit the this after. Let's get, yeah, no, yeah, this, is not, this is something that we okay. can right. right. It's been working over, over the winter. winter. Right. Yeah, yeah just, but let's see it like the draft and the yeah, we, result we, of the yeah. discussion the is we already had. If we do impose a 120 day waiting period, then sometime in, we should have something on the books by March. March, yeah. Yeah, I think a draft, some kind of draft, even just something rough would be good to look at. You want to put this on the agenda item thing? Yeah, the action items. The action item. Early January. Yeah. So that we get some motion mm -hmm. and don't come up to March and suddenly we, we're starting from here and, and Start we need to have it done. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
the friendship tree trimming um, Bartlett who does the decoration of the tree says they can do it this, this year but it's getting to be too big and um, they suggested that they would be willing to take down the friendship tree and put up a small tree mm -hmm. and my reaction to that was not necessary. <laughs> <laughs> um, the tree is a town tree. Um, so I think we should instruct Chuck that his budget should include, and, and I'm sure uh, Tom would be willing to tell him how many hours he spent trimming the tree 15 years ago or 20 years ago, and maybe. But don't take his his financial estimate on it. Yes. Um, when they say manageable size, that's kind of a qualitative statement. Do they have? What is he planning on reducing it six feet all around, or well, probably is that a discussion? More, more like fifteen feet higher, <laughs> and then outward. Um, and and I have Tom's word that the tree will recover. Brilliantly from, from that. Okay, but is that something that he should do before the lights go on this year oh, no. or after? This, this year the lights are okay. Yeah, right. oh, okay. Just, this is post. Oh, so this is post this year, post so it gives, it gives the tree many months to recover or whatever right. it has to do yeah. for uh, we... December 2025. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Um, so the consensus of the board is that we trim it rather than replace it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. More mileage. All right. I will make a motion to that effect. Excellent. I move the board recommend the friendship tree to be trimmed at the town's expense. Second. Jeff. Yes. Brian. Yes. Kathy. Yes. Anne says yes. Yes. Okay. Um. The next is the town common flagpole discussion. And. Um, the place, the exact place that it was on the diagram is very close to a stewardia that was planted by the Friends of Trees probably 20 years, no, couldn't have been that far. In memory of Bill Saltonstall, it's a really nice tree. And uh, I think the place that we want, that we agreed we would put the pole would interfere with that tree. And my thought was that we could move the pole out toward the sidewalk that part of the lawn comes to kind of a V so that the, the base and the lights for the pole would be, would be beyond the tree beyond the tree yeah. and adjacent to the to the walkway so the base would kind of meet, meet, meld in with the, with the sidewalk on one side of this and the walkway on the other and did, did our landscape designer person have an opportunity to check this new suggestion? Yeah, he, he, he's fine. With that. Okay. Yeah. We, we had actually talked about it when he was here. Um, he was toying with, you know, you don't want to interfere too much with the church and the steeple. Mm -hmm. and that's why he put it on the, the other triangle, the other angle of the triangle that, yeah. that we're talking about. We're still in the same triangle of grass. Um, we're just going to the other angle. So it's almost when you corner. come down School Street. When you you almost run it. School Street, you it was almost run into it. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's just a little it's bit. It's more in line right. with School Street, yeah, it is. which is an advantage, I think. So okay. it's 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 literally 15 feet up the street <laughs> towards the intersection. Right. Okay. I want to I want to revisit a comment that you made a, a month ago with regard to because I think we visited we we voted to have a flagpole, correct? I think mm -hmm. a month we ago. We voted to put it on the town. On on the town green. No, 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 no. town warrant. Town warrant. On the town town warrant. Okay. For, yeah, town meeting. The, you know, to let the town have a discussion if they wanted to discuss it. That's okay. All right. I'm, I'm hearing from a lot of people. Why are we waiting? All right, so I've got a question. This is what I, I, I wanted to go back to, to your comment, because in that discussion, Greg, you had said, well, there were monies, and this would cost a few thousand dollars, but there were monies for that? So we have, we have a general facilities account, building facilities fund. Yes, this would be DPW related, I yes. guess. Yes, yes. Okay, and this would be in that category. Yeah, I think, 
I think we're in the five thousand dollar range. Okay. All right. If that's the case, I, I I would like to see us proceed and have this done whenever it gets done within a reasonable amount of time without necessarily putting it on the warrant. And um, I'd make a motion to that effect that a flagpole be erected in a reasonable time. Second. I think we can still have discussion. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I guess my only concern is that we be sure that it's lighted appropriately. Yeah. With appropriate lighting because that will be a, that will have an American flag on it that is up yep. 24 seven. Mm -hmm. I forgot to mention, <coughs> I'm sorry, um, there actually is already a, uh, a law in the books that says POW MIA flags are sort of automatically permitted when you find the American flag in Massachusetts. Okay. Okay. Um, so it's, it's, it's not necessary that you make an official declaration. I, I mean, you can still, but it's, it's not required because of the statute. Right. Okay. okay. Are there any other types of flags, like state or municipal, anything else that falls into that category? Is it just the MIA POW? I'm, I'm only aware of that one. So, okay. you know, Tom Cox will make me aware of that. And I, I don't know if we made the statement at the last one, but this would be the official town flagpole. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Are you going to have any public comment about? I came just for that. Public comment on? Yes, for the flagpole. Um, so, what we're currently discussing? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm Heather Gates from School in Denver Street. And uh, I have talked to so many people since all that discussion started with the town and everybody else. And uh, I personally, um, I have a very strong feeling about the American flag because that represents the whole country. It's not just Massachusetts or us here. That's where it stands. That's where Rosa Parks created the flag and went out and that covers everyone. It doesn't matter what color you have, what race, what sex you have, anything. It covers everyone. So I'm not American. I came from Greece myself, first generation here. I always tell my kids and my husband, I have to go out and put the American flag up for the 4th of July, the mm -hmm. um, you know, Memorial Day, because I have great respect for what America stands for and stood for, for a long time, for not only here, but for other countries. And I don't understand why we have to please everybody who wants to put a flag to their own you know, idea or presence in this country. Everybody can put the flag in front of their home or on their home property. Mm -hmm. And the American flag stands for, for centuries that we're here now. It's a change only the number of stars, but still the American flag. And we have the state flag. I think we can use that also on that point from what I understand. But um, why we have controversial people who want to stand with the flag because of a certain way they are and who they are. I don't think it should discriminate. That's the kind of segregation going backwards instead of going forward and be all one. When I see the parade coming with the, you know, that uh, monument that we have over veterans, my father in the country I came from, they have to go in service, the men. And I'm so, I feel lucky that my kids didn't have to go, didn't choose to go to the service here because they give their life. You never know when you go, if you're coming alive. And that's why that monument and the flag of the POW serves there. It's not about who we are, what we are, what color, whatever. It's about what we have done as a country and these poor souls who chose to go to be in the military, Navy, everything. And they didn't know if they were going to come back. Who in the world's name, in this country or any other country, has more done for a country than giving their life? Nobody. And that's what it stands. 
I cannot compare that with the country that I come from, or the gender I am, or how old I am, or whatever. We cannot, we cannot compare that with anything other than the American flag and the POW and the flag for the veterans and the monuments. They represent the country. That's what everybody liked about America. Every time they have a problem, America is first to give. Earthquakes, wars, everything. We do everything. That's what we represent. We don't represent if I'm lesbian, gay, heterosexual, yellow, white, or black. It recovers everyone. I was talking with my youngest son, who is now in his 40s also, and he said, okay. I, think, <clears throat> I think you so made So I'm sorry, point. that's what, yeah, I, I, and a lot of people feel that, but they say there is no point of going there to talk because they do whatever. And I don't think that. I think you're decent human beings. You know what you're doing. But you try to help in this situation. That's what you're doing. Thank you. Um, okay, is there further discussion on the motion on the floor? Maybe I just got to clarify it to use current, current budget's funds to erect a flagpole that will be the town flagpole in that particular location with appropriate lighting, um, period. <laughs> Second. All right. Jeff? Yes. Brian? Yes. Kathy? No. Answers? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, um, we got on the list with the street signs. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Are there other um, liaison updates? Um, I have one. So I wish Mark was still here. Um, so I attended the downtown improvement meeting the other day, and Mark happened to mention that the planning board was considering, um, I'm not sure how I phrase this, spearheading uh, a, a team or task force to develop what they call a master plan for the general, for the downtown. Um, I remember conversations about that on some of the MBTA task force discussions because as they got into looking at the zoning, they're, they were thinking, wow, we, we don't really have a plan just for the downtown, okay? And we might, might want to think about you know, how much should be commercial, how much, you know, should we allow commercial entities to have, you know, apartments above them. So there's, there's no current zoning or, or plan, I should say, to uh, a vision for what the downtown should look like. So when he mentioned it, though, he kind of indicated that it might be a strategy more for the general district, not just the downtown. So I don't know if you heard anything, Jeff, at a planning board meeting. I'm, um, well, I, does, isn't the MBTA, the zoning is going to kind of, um, some of that's going to work into that, right? That, so, but what I have So what, 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 what I think, what I think, the discussions around the MBTA zoning have kind of um, precipitated a discussion about things that are not going to be included in the MBTA zoning. So it, 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 we have, may have a gap in our, in our plan for the master plan, right? Where's the, um, the dip fund? Well, so no, Mark mentioned it at a dip okay. meeting. Um, so what I, my personal suggestion to Mark was that you might not want to call this a separate master plan. We have a town master plan, yeah. right? So maybe it should be um, some sort of refinement or next level of detail, because uh, we don't want people doing something separate from what the master plan is, yeah. is saying. So I, I suggested to him, you know, think about the language you use if you put together a team. Maybe it should be a task force to kind of look at something. But what was new to me was the fact that they were they were they seem to expand the scope a little bit beyond the the downtown and include the general district. Um, he mentioned possibly um, you know some things they might look at is like swapping, so taking some residential lots out of 
the general district mm -hmm. and putting it into a residential district. So it was a broader scope than what I had previously heard in MBTA zoning meetings. So I just wanted to mention it, that it came up in a DIP meeting. Nothing's been done, mm -hmm. um, but I just it, I just wanted you guys to know about it. I mean, is that something that you wait till after the MBTA plays yes, out? Yes, it was definitely, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. Right. it was definitely yeah. for after that. Right, okay, yeah. Yeah, it's just that it seemed like a bigger scope than what originally had been discussed, so. Um, so Mark did mention at the end of the planning board meeting last night. Okay, uh, okay. There was a brief discussion on it. Um, and yes, he emphasized that this would be after okay. MBTA and special town meetings. The general district is very large. Right, and exactly. And it, is, it is, includes a lot of places that are purely residential. So right. maybe it makes sense to break it out. And where it may have come from early in the MBTA process, before we found out what all the rules were, <laughs> we were trying to say, trying to build a downtown that had required retail on the first Correct. floor and two floors of uh, residential above. And um, the state allows that to be built, but can't, no, you can't you can require, require it, it as part of the MPD And zone. as a result, nothing, you know, almost nothing that's, that's really <laughs> commercial is in an open division. So, so really it'd be a focus study on the general district and potential Amendments to it. He likes, he likes a controversial town meeting. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. That was all I knew. Sure. Yeah, just uh, one thing. Informal survey. How many of you folks have filled out the water survey? Led. <laughs> Who are supposed to? And I know maybe some of you. I took a look at it and I was like, ugh. All right, this is That's, generally that, the that most was common reaction. response. Oh, yes. <laughs> Jeff? Like, really I'll let my wife handle that way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let his wife handle that way. Yeah. <laughs> and? It's in my too hard place. All right, so I know what's going on here. Chuck said about, you know, he said, I don't know, 2,500 surveys. He's got about 150 or 200 back. This is what, three weeks into it. He's going to be sending out a reminder. Um, really, the key issue is, is for houses built after 1980, he's not worried about the comeback on those, and the EPA will probably give you a, a pass on those because they know that there will not be lead pipes in those houses. That does not uh, represent a cross-section of Manchester's housing stock, however. So we'll see how things progress, but they're not quite as fast as he... Like so that. I thought the requirement was to send it out. Is there a required minimum response? Because I did not hear that. There's a the, the EPA is kind of playing this as they go, but there will be a minimum response, and Chuck we, will. We need to know what that is. Yeah, way. and he'll. I mean, he's he's got a plan to continually chase down people, but I don't know if he'll get to the number he needs to get to. So ultimately, when the meter project is underway, that's when he's in each basement and, yeah. <laughs> and can verify and get that data. Okay. So uh, he's wrestling with that. The RFPs, I think, no, they have not gone out yet. Well, that was an EPA created survey? Like they yes. created it, right? It was horrible. I mean, I'm just saying, I, I was, it was a horrible Oh, you looked survey. at it and said you didn't want to do it because you looked at it. Well, it's just, you know, if. If it had said, when was your home built, okay, mm -hmm. and if it has been more recent than 1980, then you're done. Right. That would have been a smart way to construct a survey. They, they didn't, they didn't well, do that. Because that's, that's the position I'm in. I, I'm, I don't live in a really old place, and now I still got to go down. To the other, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't well. No, I, 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 yeah. I agree. Yeah. I, I filled it out, and my house is so. So maybe if Chuck really wants those of us who are in a easier position to fill it out, he could um, provide a sample. If your house is um, newer than whatever it is, 1985, 1990, whatever, here's what you here's what you put in there. 
I mean, uh, realistically, it goes way back or, further than that. Yeah. See, those people, he may go back because he knows in general what the, he, he's got a database that will say when the house was built. And for those houses, he's not going to chase those people. Well, that's what I'm saying, though. But if, it, if, if he's looking, we need to understand what he's looking for. Is it participation? Is it a response? Or does he need the information to feed the EPA? Because how you deal with it depends on which of those three scenarios it is. If he needs, a, re he needs a response. If he needs yeah. a response, then give people the canned res response based on the age of their house. If he sends me something that's, that, hey, your house was built here, this is how you fill it out, I'd be happy to. That's, yeah, that's easy to do. Right? Yeah. Make it easy for people to do the right thing. It, it was not his algorithm. <clears throat> Okay. But he, but if he really, if that's what I was trying to understand is what is the goal? If it is a response and you re need the homeowner to respond, make it easy for the homeowner to respond. We'll, we'll have to have a... To be continued. To be continued. Yeah. Um, it continues to evolve. EPA is putting on some pretty um, high demands on communities about supplying filters to people until things are changed out. So Chuck and I are sitting down tomorrow to talk about all of this. Oh, okay. Hey, you'll, then, you'll get more updated. Uh, and then so we, we can provide, at some point we need a, a full-blown discussion on okay. the process. So, um, point well taken. Yeah. And um, I accidentally blew off the school committee meeting. <laughs> I looked at my <laughs> dinner and said, oh dear, I was supposed to be someplace else. <laughs> um, they're, they're, they're not in, set, starting their budget work yet. Um, that really is the uh, part. That's where we as uh, yeah. intersect. They are allowed to run the schools all the way they want. <laughs> I don't know. And I think you've all heard more about MBTA zoning than any yeah. rational human being would ever want to be. Uh, I just want to one more time is that the uh, Friday, uh, Friday, Saturday, Saturday morning, about I thought it was very good. Yeah, they did a really well good done. job. Uh, concise, you know, uh, and obviously what I found was, let's see, I, can, I can't tell you who was there, I can tell you who wasn't there. All right. And uh, there were some new faces, though. Yeah, three. But, uh, the ones that uh, continue to claim that there's no transparency, no information out there, weren't there? Yeah. Yeah. It'll be repeated as a virtual yeah. event you know, Thursday evening um, at seven. We're basically running through the same information. Thursday. Uh, Is everything going on on Thursday? They got like fifteen things going on. <laughs> That's another. One. A busy day. <laughs> and all of this is also on the website. They'll, they'll be placing all the information on the website so people can go at their, their leisure. Um, they're creating some videos on each district, and those will be on the website. So um, there'll be lots of opportunities for people to, to get information, and we'll try to promote that as, a, as an option for people. Yeah, that's good. Have administrators report. Uh, a few items. Um, first off, the various RFPs, uh, request for proposals that are out on the street, so to speak. Or, um, expecting responses from potential recruiting firms mm -hmm. to help with uh, my replacement. And those are due the, the October 1st, and potential interviews the 2nd and 3rd. Uh, with the goal of, of having a recommendation to you at your next meeting. Um, operational audits, um, I, I've, I have um, now received all three, I've received three proposals. Um, I need to do some more follow up on those proposals and get a, a recommendation back to you. Um, the fundraiser for the Senior Center project, and those are due the 7th. Of October, and, um, I know we have one, one strong interest. We hope a couple more and will also materialize. Um, uh, we don't have it out on the street yet, but hopefully in the next couple three weeks we'll get the uh, designer selection. One of the was an architect, basically, for the, the expansion plans for the for the Mason building. Um, so hopefully that will be going out soon as well. Um, construction work continues uh, 
you know, the focus on Pleasant Street and Forest Street. Um, some concerns, you know, when, when, we, when we do a bypass, um, we have to do the bypass to provide an alternative flow for water as the main pipe is, is repaired or, in this case, relined. Um, that's the same drinking water that everyone receives. It's no different. And those bypass lines are fully um, disinfected um, and tested before they are brought online. That all has to happen. Um, now, sometimes when those are hooked up, um, there has been some disturbance in the pipe, um, different pressure, et cetera. So people may have some discolored water. Um, and the best way to clear it out is to, to run the cold faucet um, mm -hmm. for you know five, five, ten minutes, um, sometimes not that long, but it, it usually will clear up with, by just running it for a short amount of time. Um, we've had some concerns about that. Um, and we'll, we'll, again, try to get the word out that that's the case. Do we know how long people are going to be on temporary water for? Um, uh, up to two months. Two months. Hopefully a little shorter. Um, so staff updates I provided for you, um, just sort of FYI, and um, the uh, oh, Kathy already mentioned the website redesign. And obviously, updating content is an ongoing effort. We continue to work on that. Um, the police department had their reaccreditation uh, visitation from the. Uh, Creditors, uh, creditors, and that went um, very well. Um, a couple of minor issues uh, involving the uh, training of our parking enforcement officers, nothing that is not easily fixed. Um, so we expect to uh, receive accreditation for the three year period, which is um, a good accomplishment for the department. Um, so that's, that's good news. So, for that, I uh, can wrap up. Anything else that you want to talk about off? No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> Is there another motion? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye